Goodness, those lights are bright, aren't they? <laughs> as though it's not a sunny enough day, we get the lights as well. Um, thank you very much all for, for coming out, especially on, on such a sweltering uh, evening. I think our Sri Lankan guests must have brought some fantastic summer weather with them. So we're, we're very grateful to you um, even before we've started this evening. Uh, my name's Phil Clark. I'm a reader in comparative and international politics uh, here at SOAS, and I'm coordinating the research project that tonight's event uh, is a part of. Um, and we've had a, a really fantastic response from, from all of you um, about the speakers and about the topics that we're going to be uh, talking about uh, tonight. This, of course, is a public dialogue on peace and reconciliation in Sri Lanka. And I'd just like to say a little bit about the research project that this falls within uh, before I introduce our speakers uh, for tonight. The title of this research project is Learning from Leaders, Understanding Elite Experiences of Peace, Reconciliation and Forgiveness After Civil Conflict. And it's funded by uh, an NGO in the US called the FETSA Institute, uh, along with the politics department uh, here at SOAS. And in the literature on uh, responses to mass conflict, there tends to be an emphasis either on the role of uh, national elites in trying to foster peace and reconciliation, or an emphasis on community level leaders uh, who play a, a similar type of role. What this research project is, is interested in is, is something slightly different, which is uh, what uh, those of us engaged in this project are calling middle tier or go-between leaders who actually connect uh, national level processes and community level processes. And in essence, these are leaders who are themselves engaged in very important national processes related to peace and reconciliation. They take part in uh, formal elite peace negotiations. They're involved in national politics, but they're also engaged in a range of processes below that level, at the provincial level, at the district level, at, at the community level. And in essence, their role is to move backwards and forwards between these very different levels um, of, of actors. And to a large extent, we're calling this leading from the middle. We think that there's something very particular about actors who uh, fulfill this, this bridging function. And so it's worthy of investigation and, and analysis uh, as a result. What's clear in the project to date is that there are very particular challenges involved for the leaders who play this very unusual role particularly in terms of how they translate ideas between these very different levels of actors, so that something that might make sense at the national level in terms of peace processes can often be very difficult to communicate to communities uh, at, the, at, the, at the grassroots, and vice versa, that leaders in this position also play a very difficult role in translating ideas from the bottom to elites at the national level. So this go-between function requires very particular types of leadership and, as we're going to see in just a moment, very particular types of leaders uh, as individuals. The research project focuses on four particular cases. Uh, we had a very similar uh, public dialogue uh, to the one that you'll see this evening back in February, which looked at the peace process uh, in Colombia. And in fact, I know that several of our participants from the Columbia Dialogue are actually here uh, this evening, which is a nice sense of continuity for, for us as organisers. There's, of course, tonight's event on Sri Lanka. And in October and November, there'll be very similar dialogues on Northern Ireland and on South Africa. In each case, we invite pairs of leaders uh, from the case study countries who uh, come from different sides of the political or, or the social divide uh, that the conflict uh, encapsulates. The project involves firstly a series of individual research interviews, so our participants this evening have already been fully grilled uh, this morning by Richie Howarth, my, uh, my research collaborator uh, and myself. Uh, so it's very courageous of, of our participants to front up uh, for this public event this evening, having already been interrogated to the full um, this morning. And then, of course, the second part of each of these events is the public dialogue that you'll, uh, that you'll witness in just a moment, which is also part of uh, the, the research uh, process. The other function, I guess, of these public dialogues, of course, is to, to bring leaders from the countries in question to engage with a, a very wide audience, such as yourselves, and in particular to engage with uh, diaspora communities based here in London, um, who have a very direct interest, of course, in issues of, of peace and reconciliation. 
In terms of our format uh, tonight, I'm about to hand over in just a moment uh, to Dr. Sutha Nadaraja uh, from SOAS, uh, who's uh, kindly agreed uh, to moderate the public dialogue. Um, and our two participants this evening, uh, I'm sure, are already very familiar to all of you, uh, Shira Lakthilaka and Kandia uh, Savaswaran. Each of uh, our two participants will present for 10 minutes, focusing particularly on their personal role in issues of peace and reconciliation in Sri Lanka. And then Sooth is going to facilitate a conversation uh, between them. There'll be plenty of time, of course, for discussion uh, with you as the audience. I should say at the outset, this event uh, is being uh, recorded. Uh, it is being videoed, and so everything that you say is on the record, so bear that in mind, especially when we get to the Q&A part of this evening. Finally, let me uh, introduce uh, our speakers, and then I'm going to hand over uh, to Sutha. Our, our first uh, leader participating uh, this evening is Shiral Lakdilaka. He's a member of the United National Party in Sri Lanka, where he's currently the coordinating secretary to President Sirisena. He's a lawyer and an author on conflict resolution. He served as a member of the Provincial Council and he's consulted in the Ministry of Constitutional Affairs during uh, a whole series of different peace processes in Sri Lanka. He was also previously the director of the Colombo Institute of Social Studies. Our second dialogue participant is Dr. Kandia Sabaswaran, who is a Tamil National Alliance a politician uh, who has served as a member of the National Provincial Council since 2013. He currently assists the Chief Minister on economic planning, and he's also the younger brother to the current president of the Elam People's Revolutionary Liberation Front. He was also previously a lecturer in political science at the University of Colombo, so both of our speakers at certain stages have straddled the divide between academia and policy making. Both Shiral and Savez have also been involved in an initiative that I'm sure they'll speak about a great deal this evening called the One Text Initiative, which has been a very important dialogue process in Sri Lanka uh, over the last 10 years or so. And our chair this evening is Dr. Sutha Nadaraja, who's a lecturer in the Center for Diplomacy and International Studies here at SOAS. His research looks at issues of security, development, and liberal governance, uh, examining security threats and the role of the international community. And his work has a particular focus on conflict uh, in Sri Lanka. So without any further ado, I want to hand over uh, to Sutha. Um, and once again, a very warm welcome to both Shiral and Savez. We're really ecstatic that, that you're here. Thanks for coming all this way. And we look forward to what you have to say this evening. Thanks very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, uh, we were not sure whether the heat would encourage most of you to go to the park or the pub instead. Um, so my role as chair is to effectively facilitate a dialogue between our two speakers, uh, which includes forcing them to talk. So the idea is that um, the Srila will say some opening comments, Sarves will say some opening comments, they will respond to each other's comments, and then it will be a dialogue primarily between the two of them. I might intervene using chair's privilege to compel them to say more about a particular thing that they've said, which may not be clear or which may be controversial and so on. Um, at the end, in the last half an hour, 45 minutes, we will take questions from, the, from, from yourselves. Um, and I would encourage you to be robust in your questioning. But I would also encourage you to ask questions rather than um, give speeches. Um, I've been to many um, events where, you know, diaspora are present, um, and people are quite rightly have strong feelings and have things to say. But I would encourage that tonight's event is really about our two guests. Um, so before we, they start, I'd just say a quick couple of minutes to say something about the context in which we are holding this event. As we all know, and you all know a lot of this, but I'll just summarize it. So Sri Lanka's armed conflict ended in 2009, but the subsequent years uh, were not seen by moves towards peace and reconciliation, but rather the deepening of antagonisms and the emergence of new ones. Um, there's a lot that can be said about Sri Lanka, but in relevance to peace and reconciliation, three issues have nonetheless risen to the top. The first is the lack of any kind of political dialogue, certainly at the level of elites, uh, but even other initiatives 
that might take place that might produce a political solution to the country's ethnic conflict. The second is the continuation of certain kinds of continuities from the war era. So particularly in the north and east, the presence of the military in large numbers, uh, the expansion of the military into other aspects of life, economic life in particular, um, and so on, uh, have been uh, a serious impediment to the possibility of the emergence of reconciliation. The third, and more, probably the most significant, has been the international campaign for accountability for wartime atrocities. Now, um, the matter has been simmering for a long time, but particularly over the last two years, it's become internationalized, and the United Nations is conducting an investigation which will report probably in September. Now, all these elements have taken place in uh, a context where uh, a particular leadership that started before the war, President Mahinda Rajapaksa's government, was in place, which is why the election, the sudden election of uh, President Sirisena in January has opened up a lot of optimism that things might be different. Um, now, since then, some people remain optimistic, some people are less optimistic, but what we can say with certainty is that this is one of the most turbulent times in Sri Lanka's political trajectory. Uh, parliament was dissolved last week, elections will be held in August. No one can really predict exactly how things will pan out. But the consequences, whichever way they pan out, for peace and reconciliation are quite significant. So with that as the context, um, I would like to invite Srilal to state his opening comments. Good evening to everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, let me first uh, extended, extend my thanks to the Department of Political Science at SOAS, as well as Dr. Phil Clark, for inviting me for this <clears throat> public dialogue. And also, it's a privilege, as well as a honor to me, to be present here and talk to you on Sri Lankan challenges. Uh, after 10 years of grueling and suffocating uh, behavior in Sri Lankan society, I'm here and talking with certain proud because for the first time in an international fora, we can talk as Sri Lankan citizens about establishing humane civilized and democratic society in Sri Lanka. This has happened after Ju January 8th, where, the, where our presidential election happened. We managed to transform Sri Lanka from uh, autocratic and pan-nationalistic politics into democratic politics in Sri Lanka. Nobody expected this kind of change, but now we are experiencing that. We managed to transform the society and introducing certain constitutional changes to Sri Lanka, which brings certain structures that would help to democracy and certain processes which would enhance the functioning of those structures, especially the set of attitudes, democratically based, to create an edifice or foundation to create new Sri Lanka. So this is a, in short time, in six months of time, we are proud, we are happy, and we are contented we managed to create a new space to Sri Lanka. Uh, peace, reconciliation, transitional justice are challenging and contentious issues still to Sri Lanka, but we are quite confident that with this gained democratic space, we would be able to deal with those challenging and contentious issues. I'm telling these are challenging and contentious because we see that 
there is a different difference of opinion in the divide on these issues when it come to peace we see lot of rhetoric as well as policy needs involving peace or resolving the sri lankan question of uh, non majority communities so in reconciliation although we talk about reconciliation i my my personal opinion is it's too early to talk about reconciliation because it's a although it's a post war uh, uh issue sri lanka never had a post negotiation stage after the war what we see is that victorious community and a defeated community in that context it's very difficult to think about political reconciliation or basic limbs of reconciliation such as political reconciliation where you have to resolve the externalization of decision making process of certain communities and also victim perpetrator reconciliation how to forgive and forget in the context of victorious mentality these are challenges to us and also in a way only area it is uh, possible to do something is psychosocial reconciliation at the moment so we have to talk about transitional justice in this context sri lankan government although i am representing my individual capacity here is not afraid to deal with this subject we are quite confident that we can deal with that but the government needs certain space and time to deal with this that is our position uh, but that does not mean that like previous government we can put these issues under the carpet and uh, push the agenda further down in the timeline so in a way uh, what i have to say in my opening remark that sri lanka is opening up for new era and space that does not mean that we don't have uh, uh, conflicts we don't have challenges so all these things depends on courageous decision making political decision making in the country now if i take further down from the topic which i was interested in relation to reconciliation now transitional justice my personal opinion is that there are so much of rhetorics involved in this whole debate so therefore it is a challenge for us to understand the policy contest between the sri lankan state and the tamil action when i say tamil action or tamil political action it encompasses all the groups who are talking about one, although with different voices but talking about one thing now in conflict resolution it is a challenge to understand this political policy conflict that is a challenge before us if i further explain to you on my personal opinion on this i would rather like to borrow some words from famous military strategist klaus wich which he has said a military war is an extension of a political contest now what is the political contest contest in sri lanka that is the most important thing when it come to 
resolving the political reconciliation or finding an answer for point political reconciliation or other reconciliation aspects plus uh, victim perpetrator reconciliation. We can hear a lot of statements. We can hear a lot of positions. All these positions are connected with each and every group's value system. So values create data. For Sri Lankan government holds certain set of data. The Tamil ethnopolitical action holds certain set of data. None of these are correct. For instance, my personal opinion is, I'm, I don't believe the previous government's position of zero casualty uh, policy in Bo. Also, I don't believe 40,000 deaths in the last day or last two days of war. So all these are positions taken by various parties or concerned parties. So therefore, it's a challenge before us to identify the real data and then develop consensual uh, criteria to interpret this data. So it is a technical work, but some may don't like to uh, hear this kind of approach. But that does not mean when I say this, we believe that even one person died, a civil personality died in a war, the state should be rec uh, responsible for that. We, for a moment, we are not going to evade from the responsibility, but on the same time, if we want to have a, a meaningful and long-lasting solution for this, we have to overcome with these uh, ongoing battles on data, as well as we have to search for an overarching value frame. Now, when you, when you talk about uh, finding solution for Sri Lanka, first we have to ask, what is the problem? Now, when I ask this, you will say that, don't you know? No, everybody knows, but everybody have different interpretation for that. So, therefore, challenge, even after 30 years of war as well as uh, negotiations, as well as interactions, to develop a consensus about the nature of the Sri Lankan conflict. So, there are so many challenging areas to discuss. With that comment and note, I may stop at this point and allowing Sudha to take me from there onwards. Thank you. Thank you sure. well, before um, we ask our speakers to respond to each other, I'll ask our way to give his introductory comments. <coughs> Good evening. Friends, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, to the team uh, of SOAS in this project to invite me and provide this privilege to share my thoughts and little experience on the reconciliation process on and off comes and goes in Sri Lanka. <coughs> Of course, uh, I appreciate my friend, he gave very optimistic thoughts, and also I would like to be optimistic, and we are optimistic, but in different connotation. It's a conflict is, uh, to my understanding, it starts from 1917s or 18s, it's nearing a century now. It took different forms. 
with different demands at different times and different forms of from democratic parliamentary struggle to Gandhian struggle in outside and armed struggle. Then enough after a full circle, now again to some kind of power sharing and war reparation, atrocities, or legacy of the war, etc. In the case of reconciliation in Sri Lanka, before that reconciliation, we will know that there is a conflict. And what is that conflict is simply in Sri Lanka. The majority people, the singular <coughs> Buddhist, are governed, or the singular polity is governed by an ideology of that the Sri Lanka is singular Buddhist state, and the Singhalese are the son of the soil, and the rest are aliens. This is the fundamental impediment of any kind of, this is the uh, fundamental source of conflict and fundamental impediment of any kind of a solution all along for 60 years. This, uh, Every government, as my friend Shiral said, now after 10 years of an autocratic <coughs> and racist kind of a government, now we change and kind of open space for a democracy or kind of a democratic space. We had almost the same kind of a scenario after 17 years of GR Yavartana rule and then Chandrika Bandar Naika came in 1994 with almost the same kind of slogan of for a conflict resolution. She said that um, this is basically or primarily a political conflict and not an armed conflict. Therefore, it needs a political dialogue and a solution. Then there was a, two, three years, there was a very good space for democracy and dialogue and everything. But finally, then the hardliners took upper hand and that is gone into dock. Then Rajabaksha came, another 10 years of long atrocities, a genocidal war, more than 140,000, as my friend said that I don't believe 40,000. Of course, it is not a belief, it is a government's role to uh, get the accountability because they have the entire system to get the accountability. What I say, the 146,000 is the statistics from the war zone district uh, population statistics. It is government statistics. Of course, it may be, there may be some error here and there, but still the government, even the previous government and the present government are failed to find out the exact figure. It is a responsibility of the government. This is not a guessing game. Of course, United Nations, they are whatever the available uh, scrutinized documents, they found that is approximately 40. Another UN estimation said it is 70,000. And we say it is 140. Of course, the game is different. But the government's responsibility is a government. So government always has the responsibility, accountability. Therefore, it is not necessary to go for this guessing and gossiping. So why they are hesitating to bring out all the facts? Because these are very bitter facts. Once the facts comes out, it will expose them as a, to, the war is not merely a war against terrorism, but it is designed under the guise of war against terrorism to eliminate as much as, uh, as much as much civilians also, because they used a lot of banned weapons and artilleries and bombs, cluster bombs, napalm bombs, etc. And also they bombed, I think a lot of uh, audience here would have been aware of evidences and there are a lot of uh, publications came out from um, uh, latest of about Auckland report from US. Uh, 
United Nations uh, Secretary General's expert report on Sri Lanka, then the internal review report of United Nations, then we have um, <coughs> crisis, uh, crisis group uh, report. There are a number of reports came and all the reports are coming out with this lot of facts which are uh, which indicate the government which is, is a kind of a uh, well-planned genocidal kind of attack. The government was maintained until the end of the war for almost three, four years, saying that only 70,000 people are in the war zone where it was nearly 480,000 people were there. And they sent food and medicine for only for 70,000 people for months and months. And even the people, when they were in the queue for medicine and uh, food, they were bombed and utterly bombed. They killed on the queues. And so. so what I say is the United Nations, this issue was taken up when the United Nations tried to go for investigation. Sri Lanka is government, the, all the governments and all the political leaders die hard to prevent any kind of uh, independent investigation or the United Nations official investigation because the truth is bitter. As he said, he accepted that this kind of, of a genocidal war, a huge amount of loss of lives, huge amount of property is completely destroyed. Even the, after the war, there are uh, vast areas are occupied by the, forcibly occupied by the army areas in the sense it is, it is civilian areas and civilian, uh, civilian uh, settlements. More than, uh, it, is, it is estimated nearly 100,000 acres. And also the northern province is in under de facto military rule. It is out of 20 divisions of the army. 15 divisions are in the northern province where the total population is 1 million. So five is to one. Apart from army, there are Navy and Air Force. So this is the scenario where we are looking for reconciliation and peace. So the previous government openly said that Sri Lanka is one country, we are one people. That means indirectly, the Tamils supposed to reconcile themselves as minority and mentally you should be ready to assimilate with us. Or even some Buddhist monks and hardliners said, otherwise better you go to South India. As I earlier said, the mindset is the son of, they are the son of the soil and others are aliens. That means they say that if you want rights, if you want equal rights, go and ask in South India in Tamil Nadu. It is absolutely mythical and it's absolutely authoritarian kind of talk because Sri Lankan Tamils are the oldest civilization of Sri Lanka. We know that singular so the sort of Buddhism, the date of Buddhism arrived in Sri Lanka. That is 2,500 years. Even when Buddhism comes, there's a strong civilization. And about those studies, I don't want to go deeper to the history. So here, how a reconciliation is possible. As he said, how the present situation is, it's almost the same kind of a situation prevailed after the Jayavartana period to when Chandrika Bandarnaka took over the position, where I was one of the uh, maybe hundreds of intellectuals working for reconciliation because Chandrika Bandarnaka threw a political package for a resolution we believed that she will do it because she came out with a big support, including the Tamils. She openly said that this is absolutely a political conflict, therefore I'm going for a political dialogue and solve the problem. So we fully uh, trusted and we were working for four or five years on it, promoting uh, Chandrika's political package and to, and to uh, go for awareness programs on the people. But within years, 
the entire climate changed, the hardliners took upper hand, and Chandrika Bandarnaika's whole, the democratic space was completely shadowed by the hardliners. And then entire exercise went on vain, so we all get vanished. Now also we have that problem, big question, because even the present regime, that is, uh, the difference is in Chandrika's regime, it is a, we have two major parties ruling one after the other. Chandrika Bandanaka belongs to SLFP, and at that time the UNP was the opposition. And now it is a difference is, the president is supported by all the parties, including the UNP, and UNP is in the parliament, president is there, so therefore it is somewhat a national uh, government. So in that case, we, don't, we will not have a partisan politics like in the past, in this time. And now parliament is dissolved. In another two months, we will have new government. So we are expecting, since the president is, belongs to a party which is supported by the opposition, therefore the uh, forthcoming government also will be a national government. We have a hope that we, this kind of uh, political climate is rare in Sri Lanka. That means both the major parties are together in the power. At the same time, we have a serious problem that we do not have a local mechanism to go for a resolution. Because within the country, last 60 years, we had so many exercises, agreements, dialogues, and disownment, betrayals, etc. So that's what now the Tamils completely lost trust on any Sri Lanka's governments. That's why they wanted the interference of the United Nations or the international community to directly involve it and assure a solution, a sustainable solution. I think it's in September, United Nations uh, Human Rights Commission will be coming out with an uh, investigation report on the human rights violation and the war crimes in Sri Lanka. I do not know exactly what will be the outcome, whatever it may be, but from that, based on that, I expect that United Nations can involve with a new government and to find a solution that is the only practicable way out, I, I, I hope. Otherwise, as he said, of course, there are some good, good spaces there, we can do it. It is not, there are a number of friends, I had a lot of friends among singles, he is also my friend. We were working together many times, but when it comes to solution, there are a lot of other forces, they simply influence and encroach and collapse it. So in, in Sri Lanka now, the hardliners are in upper hand. Whether it is Rajapaksa's regime, or even in the present ruling regime also, within that the hardliners are still powerful and they are very much uh, supported and abetted by a number of forces outside. Therefore, it is not that easy that, as he said, that we find out or thrash out a solution within the framework of Sri Lanka and the, within the, within the uh, uh, domestic mechanism or using the domestic mechanism. There is no domestic me mechanism at all. Therefore, it is very much important the active and concrete involvement of the United Nations with a new government. Then only we can have a solution or sustainable solution to the problem. And Tamils, since they do not believe, because in Sri Lanka we have 75% of Singular Buddhists and rest are, uh, rest are Tamil speaking. Therefore, and also, uh, as I told that the governing philosophy is that the, it is a singular Buddhist state. Therefore, they are always have a vulnerability that any time a solution, whether it is federal or whatever it's autonomous solution, can be simply uh, manipulated or maneuvered through constitution by the majority. Therefore, it needs a kind of a underwrite of any solution by the United Nations. This is what the Tamils are expecting from the last 60 years of war. 
and 60 years of struggle and the agreements and the betrayals and the disownments of uh, whatever we had uh, came through. I am very much op optimistic and very much believe because I was working in Columbia University for 20 years. I have a lot of friends in all, all communities personally. That doesn't mean that the different mindset of the people, the, the Sri Lankan community, the Tamils and Sinhalese, are, it is kind of a vertical division in all spheres of the life. The same political issue or the same problem is given absolutely opposite by the two different <laughs> medias, two communities' medias. So like that, it is a single, the same issue is portrayed by the single leaders to the single masses differently and Tamil leaders to differently. That means that kind of a vertical. So here, what I say, it is the kind of a conflict between the fact and myth. There is a, a, what I feel is fundamentally the problem for conflict and, uh, and, and, and the impediment for any kind of a solution is kind of a uh, identity construction issue of the Sinhalese and the denial of the Tamil identity. So therefore, there is a fundamental, it needs a kind of a paradigm shift on the thinking of the singular people. The thinking of the singular people is stemmed from or promoted by the literatures and the propagandas of singular and the Buddhist monks and the section of the hardline people. So it is to be changed. It is not easy to change that, but it needs a will and, and guts to the singular political leaders to say the truth to the people instead of construct the mythological matters as an uh, identity. So therefore, uh, that's why I said that the domestic mechanism is very much blurred unvulnerable and not very strong. If there is a domestic mechanism is available and if there is any strong mechanism, in the last 60 years, we would have been thrashed out some kind of solution. So therefore, the, uh, the involvement of sort of a concrete involvement of the United Nations is necessary. Uh, and I hope that uh, forthcoming government will be a national government, so there is no uh, partisan politics that one will pull, uh, pull the carpet of the other. Uh, the chances are less, therefore, uh, that opportunity should be utilized by the United Nations on the interest of a nation, that is the Tamil nation of Sri Lanka. In that case, we will have a very good, the island, I mean, uh, island uh, uh, that as a paradise of the earth as in, uh, as, as we usually in Sri Lanka uh, propagating the uh, island, uh, sort of paradise of the earth, the island. So real paradise will come after that. So the, the reconciliation in Sri Lanka is very much precondition on any kind of a sustainable re resolution. So the sustainable resolution is still not, haven't come. There were times, some hope that at Chandrika's period, or in 1956 and 1958 agreements, then everything got short-lived and uh, toppled by partisan politics continuously in that. So, uh, with this, it is, seems to be pessimistic, but not. The optimism comes in different context. I do have optimism, and we are working towards that. Of course, all we need a reconciliation, brotherhood, and a dignified life as equal citizens in the island. But the approach is different. What is my context is we, even though both feel the aim is same for us, all the idea is we will have reconciliation after a sustainable solution is found. 
and we hope that with the forthcoming new government, with the support of United Nations, so the number of uh, international forces, we can find a resolution and to work for a uh, reconciliation and one Sri Lanka. On this, let me stop you there. Yeah, on this lot. on this note, I will uh, stop my uh, remark, and I think uh, Sudha will take over that. Yeah. Um, well, the idea is that Trila will respond to um, Tari's comments. There are a lot of comments. Um, do you want to pick out some things that you want to respond to first and come back to them later? Yeah, I, I just want to say this. Uh, I'm not here to hear holding brief for Sri Lankan state. I'm a fierce critic of consecutive Sri Lankan governments and its behavior. And also known people know that for last three decades, how much I have contributed for the rights issue of the Tamil people. But on the same time, I have a, crit I have a criticism for Tamil political action from the middle point. Now, if you look at the Sarvesh statement, Sarvesh not, was not bothered to say anything about his side. Right? Every blame was put into the state. Now, we know when you talk about the negotiations happened in 2003, who is to be blamed? Have anybody done a proper research on that? I'm not going to blame anybody. But when uh, Sarvesh talks about uh, planned genocide, now what about in same humanitarian law, if some party uses a civilian as a human shield, so will it not considered as a contributory factor? So. I'm not going to react for Sarvesh every statement. He has a truth as well as rhetoric. From Sri Lankan government side also the same. They touch the truth and also goes with the rhetorics. So what is the, that is my initial remarks also, that is what I said. The challenge is to find the middle ground. That is the reality. Now, now Sarvesh statement is very emotional. For those who have not studied the, the Sri Lankan conflict, actually everybody would have been moved by his statement. That is true. That is politics. But conflict resolution is something else. We are here, I am here to see and say with an optimism. I was optimistic in 2003. I was optimistic in 2019-94. Even tomorrow, I would start my work with certain optimism. That's how we work, because we are not part of this both sides. Unfortunately, this middle group is not powerful in Sri Lanka. Both sides hurling accusations as well as blames each other. Uh, that's what happened. So that's my initial remark for sir. <clears throat> this is um, in any country it is a responsibility of any democratic government to deliver good governance as I earlier explained that the philosophy or the ideology that governs the singular Buddhist society that's a fundamental problem from that. Because of that, the conflict arose and escalated. Therefore, it is always the ball is at the court of the government to go for a good governance or to rectify the problems. You cannot put the ball on us because we are in the vulnerable side and we are, in the, we are the victims 
and we are so in a police station you cannot go and ask that it's a, it's a police station supposed to look after the law and order they cannot blame us that what it, uh, why you are doing this and that so it is like that it is not uh, you, if 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 i am the government it is different it is between two governments it is different but we are a suppressed society <coughs> in a chauvinistic regime so therefore if you say that to uh, vulnerable section always take guard to pr pr protect themselves or protect themselves so it is it is true that there are number of criticisms on the part of the uh, when it comes to uh, armed conflict the when the use of arms there will be lot of uh, uh, rights and wrongs that is there are that we cannot confuse with the cause of the struggle the cause of the struggle is different from the uh, what they call the means to to the end when we apply the means there may be you have you may have criticism you may have rights and wrongs but the cause is not challenged entire world is accept the cause of the tamils therefore i think the cause if we have we, we are talking always about to 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 address the root cause of the conflict but always the successive governments <coughs> trying to show lollipop to crying child in hunger this is the attitude always but all they always say that uh, i mean always always this kind of rhetoric of resolution the last 60 years why we were not unable to thrash out because of we were living under continuous rhetorics of uh, singular political leaders leaders they were successful of keeping the international community to uh, believe on that rhetoric but it is after this war only international community found that of course there was a, there were a sort of a planned things so uh, uh, it's a sort of a planned attacks on civilians the proofs came and on that they are look they are asking for accountability so from that what i would like to say it is the responsibility of the government it is does not mean that the uh, uh, people do not have any responsibility but they are a suppressed community they are always in a kind of a defensive position to protect them therefore you cannot it is difficult to blame on that part to 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 protect yourself you may go to any extent okay i i had a i noticed a co uh, kind of contradiction in both the things you said. Um, on the one hand, you said nothing can be done except psychosocial reconciliation. But then you said, I'm optimistic. <coughs> you said nothing can be done unless there's a political solution, but I'm optimistic. So there has to be something wrong there because either things are going to get better now that we have a new president and may have a new government, or they're not. Right? So I'd ask each of you to explain. Can you hear me? Maybe they turned it off. Maybe I talked too much. Uh, could you explain why you think we should be optimistic? Yeah, in, in conflict resolution, you as a conflict resolution practitioner, if you don't have optimism, you can't deal with conflicts. Right? The first thing. Second thing is, uh, when in negotiations we use that basket theory, now, you have several eggs in the basket, but first you have to select the egg where you can make the omelette, right? So, in my context, my, my opinion, reconciliation, the word reconciliation, reconciliation is hard to achieve in Sri Lanka, there is no argument. But, now when you talk about reconciliation, there are three facets for reconciliation. The one is the political reconciliation. Second is psychosocial reconciliation. And third is victim-perpetrator reconciliation. 
Now, this word reconciliation is used normally in conflict resolution parlance uh, in post negotiated negotiation periods, not in post war periods. Now, if you look at the civil war in America, they never used the word reconciliation. They call minimum 10% program. Why is that? Now, this is the problem with the previous government of Sri Lanka. They gave unnecessary hopes by using certain words which are not applicable to the context. Now, if you look at the way how the war ended, you had a victor and a defeated. Now, in such a context, it's very difficult to have a victim perpetrator reconciliation. Forgiving and forgetting is not possible. Where everybody is going after each other's blood. Right? So, we can talk, but it is not possible. On the other hand, the political reconciliation is a perennial problem for Sri Lanka for the last several decades, which has not happened on various uh, reasons. So, to me, that's why I had my initial remarks also. I said, what is the problem? To me, the problem of Sri Lanka, I, I fully agree with, the, with what uh, Sarvesh has said, it is the responsibility of the state. No, no, no arguments. But even to uh, uh, resettle with the state, but you have to identify the state problem. Now, look at the history. In Oslo, when we declared it as an Oslo declaration from the Tamil action, political action said, no, no, it's not a declaration, it's a communique. What happened? When we tried to develop a, a contours of the conflict based on internal self-determination, the Tamil political action refused to accept it. That's what, that is history. When, when I tried to go and conduct a, a workshop for the LTT cadres on uh, as a member of uh, civil society, in that they, they, they never wanted to do that. So on the same time, Sarvesh is blaming the history. I'm not going to blame anybody that very carefully. I'm, I'm using my words. I don't want to blame anybody. But what we want is to understand the problem. There is an issue on that, although we pretend that there is no issue. So to me, personally, the Sri Lankan issue is it's, it's want of political liberty and political equality of Tamil people. In a way, we can say it is the self-determination self -determination of the Tamil people. But then, how to convert that into action? What is the solution? Whether Now, some group says, we want separate state. Another group says, we want confederation. Another group says, no federal. Right? From state, it is unitary, minimum of unitary decentralization to devolution. So in this spectrum, there are groups who are fighting ideologically and uh, academically. This is what happened in Sri Lanka. Although thousands of conflict resolution efforts have applied in Sri Lanka, the very small thing has not happened. So that is the reality. So. But I have to say on that, 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 that this whole thing, reconciliation, yes, there's a contradiction when we talk about human conflicts. But I am optimistic. And on the other hand, I, when I say, on the same breath, I, when I say that there is a problem, I consider it as the two sides of a coin. Right? Coin goes on. So that's my approach. So otherwise, you can't resolve these things. No, I'm just being cynical about it. Why should we be optimistic? What I mean, if I mean, if you listen to may, may, I, may I may I answer for that, Sudha? Yes, you can be cynical. You can give up the optimism. Then what you have to do? They have to age a war. Then what happened? The cycle once again goes back. 
so i know it, when i say so it's very unfair and suffocating i'm i'm putting a suffocating idea right so what else you have to then fight with a nation state and establish a separate state if you don't have the optimism then that is the only solution well, in, 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 in a very brutal manner I'm, i am saying well that's precisely why i would see that you have this wide spectrum of of people who don't believe that reconciliation is possible but you made a very specific claim you said that because the new president has come in and because um 10 years of autocracy is over mm. therefore we should be optimistic about peace and reconciliation yeah so that if you look at the government statements right now uh on reconciliation uh, we have stated the availability of the sri lankan state to develop a local mechanism on uh, transitional justice issue so so how to do it and when to do that is a question but the basic principle if you look at the manifestos of the two sides both sides had agreed that uh, local mechanism would be available in sri lanka okay at that point as i say already uh, said that we had a long uh, decades long uh, struggle <coughs> and number of uh, attempt uh, in domestic level and ended with uh, uh, absolutely a waste exercise uh, that is why i explain already it no need to uh, responded back but of course uh, the present uh, government uh, appointed chandrika bandar naikas chairmanship a reconciliation committee um but still not uh, the, the the picture is very clear but the committee is formed but so far they did not come out with any kind of uh, uh, plans or ideas or proposals uh, but as i say told earlier as long as the the governing philosophy is not changed the domestic working of functioning of domestic mechanism is a big question therefore the the long uh, experience of tamils from the side of the singhalese the sort of a lot of agreements and what you call uh, dialogue level acceptance words were disowned continuously they completely lost trust that is why the sri lankan politics sort of this conflict is externalized and internationalized and the tamil searching for the support of the international support to intervene and to find a solution i am not uh, opposing if there is any very good mechanism emerge in sri lanka but that is a, what i guess is it is an illusion or imagination but what i feel is optimism should be on what you call some kind of possible cards this is we are planning to uh, bring out a local mechanism of course there is a good exercise and good effort i appreciate and accept and even i may support it it's no problem but it is it is uh, to my knowledge it is more of an illusion there is no such fertile ground for that as i so told you now the hardliners are very much powerful in the sri lankan politics whether it is in uh, opposition or in the government sector they are always crop up on times of any kind of a resolution attempt the hardliners simply crop up and they simply pull the carpet and roll down the people who are in the top level and effort even president say see the buddhist monks are opposing what can i do the prime minister say see the singular people are opposing what can i do this is the whole exercise of from 1940s to now of course i i i, I very much appreciate my friend his optimism i am also optimistic as he said that how if you say that you are not uh, believing the domestic mechanism and how you can have the uh, optimism of course as i told that why we are 
looking for United Nations involvement because the domestic mechanism, of course, there will be a domestic climate because of non-partisan situation will be there in the forthcoming new government, we believe. That means two opposition parties, I mean two major parties got together and formed the government. Therefore, there will be no partisan politics and one will not pull the carpet of the other. So the climate will be better and the position of international community to, it's easy to handle it. Therefore, we, I say it is an optimistic and we are working towards that end. I do not say that we are against uh, any kind of uh, good efforts. Actually, we appreciate because it needs the good efforts and that's a good, uh, what you call, good sentiments and change of mind. It is very much necessary to thrash out a solution, as I said in the forthcoming year. What do you think? No, that is true. I mean, I, I have no argument or I have, I, I have no, uh, but I would like to bring this whole discussion into a new, new line from, from the beginning. When Sarvesh said that this uh, planned genocide happened in Sri Lanka, I totally disagree with that. When you apply the Nuremberg principles, you, you have to prove certain elements to uh, uh, prove that planned genocide. I, 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 I agree there are civilian casualties, there is no argument and also I agree with uh, Sarvesh when he said even one civilian has died, the Sri Lankan state has to be responsible and the government cannot escape from that responsibility. That is true. But now when it comes to international law, there are three kinds of laws apply, would apply for Sri Lankan context. One is international criminal law. The second is humanitarian law. And third is human rights violations. Now, if you study whatever Daruswan report or Australian law evidence project or whatever reports, study carefully as from lawyer's point of view, I'm, I'm saying the, the responsibility vacillate between uh, human rights violation and humanitarian law violation. So if you look at the Sri Lankan point of view, that's why I'm saying that I'm not going to defend the, the Sri Lankan state, but you have to take it from the point of the context. Uh, ultimately, even you, you, even you ended up with a tribunal, it's a matter of lawyers to argue. Right? So, uh, how are I going to attribute the responsibility? That's an issue. What about the contributory negligence or contributory aspect? of this whole affair. Uh, yes, there was certain issues where you cannot escape, where I, I, I firmly believe and I firmly lobby that those cases must be tried within the Sri Lankan court system. For that, what you have to do is, uh, you have to introduce a certain amendment to the Sri Lankan penal code, which uh, uh, brings in uh, uh, international law violation uh, responsibility and convert into a penal responsibility. We had done something like that in 1995, 96, uh, when we ratified the torture convention. We introduced uh, 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 piece of legislation because we have a dualist nature of uh, uh, constitution where you have to bring in the, whatever the international law through a legislation, through the parliament. Uh, we brought a, a legislation and create a new jurisdiction under the high court system uh, to indict whoever committed torture, torturing in Sri Lanka and there are so many cases uh, filed and uh, tried before high courts. So likewise, although the, I mean, there's a natural, natural, because Sri Lankan, Sri Lankan judicial system, time to time, you know, wavering from independency to the partisan thing. 
But now, if you look at the recent uh, two cases uh, tried before High Court, uh, one is that uh, JVP time killing. Uh, one uh, SSP, ASP was indicted and charged, uh, sentenced, and also that massacre case, all were convicted. So, uh, I firmly believe uh, that uh, in, 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 in the perspective of larger reconciliation, if you want to uh, not that not that I'm I'm trying to mitigate uh, the responsibility of Sri Lankan state, but uh, if you want to think about larger reconciliation, you have to go for a local uh, uh, mechanism. If you want to go separate from Sri Lanka, the Tamil community, then go for international uh, uh, tribunals. Those are the two options in in front of us. Morally, uh, what is Sarvais is saying is correct, morally. But pragmatically, if you look at the problem, these are the options. So I do not uh, think that uh, I have to explain more because my friend even he accepts that it's morally right. So on the moral grounds, that is, uh, the government is... Politics are not like moral. To, no, 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 it's, it's not so. Thing is, we are expecting... Uh, what, what, you, what uh, you say is, we have to... If we want to be one country, or reconciliation, then we need to evade these issues, or forget these issues, because the singular people will get angry. Or if you want to go separate, then you can go to international community and international courts. What I said is, even in any, in any society, it is even without conflict, if injustice is done, then to restore the justice is a natural need. And how can you deny that? May I, may I interrupt uh, Sarvesh for no, a minute? Let, let, oh, let, I, I, no, no, I, I, there's, a, there's a gap what I have said because you understood wrongly. Because there's an ongoing process that is Maxwell Parnagama Commission, which I also believe is not, not perfect, right? What you have to do is first, you have to identify the affected families and people. So that is the data. Then only you have to come to that. Otherwise, uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm not that harsh to say that you have to put everything on the carpet and evade the response. Yeah, in, in, no, in, in my, in my uh, initial mark, uh, remark, uh, I told that it is basically the duty of the government to take the entire data of the, the, on the war affected people, how many people were killed, how many became orphans, how many became under chronological illness of cell attack, no, there are, there are hundred, uh, in one district, the clinic itself is five, more than 5,000 disabled people, they lost limbs and I mean, uh, legs or hands or whatever. Uh, many hundreds of students, I mean, even the students, you know, more than 400 students still have cell pieces in their body in, uh, I mean, uh, very frequently they faint in the schools and vomit in schools and like that. And we are doing it through the, uh, through the uh, provincial uh, council uh, ministries, the doctors, and we are, we are trying to uh, address these issues. But even uh, I brought a, a resolution in the provincial council, Northern Provincial Council, to take a complete data in the Northern Province because we can do it in the Northern Province itself only. The Eastern Province has supposed to do it because central government is always uh, blocking, even to go for an independent kind of a taking this kind of a data, and even a provincial council when we take that is also blocked by army. When we go, it's in everywhere is army. It is 150,000 armies there in each and every village, and one week people goes and they are immediately intermediate, intermediate, and so we cannot do it practically. So it, is, it needs a central government support to do it. If we want to do it this, without the central government support, and central government supposed to uh, say the uh, intelligence and the army to uh, stay inside and, and, and allow the work. 
without which we cannot do it because otherwise simply they will arrest us also. This is the situation in Sri Lanka. The situation is entirely different actually, as not as he said. So the data, how is the government supposed to take the data, but government do not want to take the data. There are some data from the divisional secret level, but that is, it is not very, how, how do you say, um, it is very much ironical. I know a lot of people are afraid to give data to the government side because always intelligence simply entered the house and okay, uh, if they give that, okay, my son is killed in the war. So immediately they say, you are the uh, former LTT terrorist. They arrest. Still, after the war, the Prevention of Terrorism Act is strengthened further and grossly abused to take always to, to, to terrorize the Tamils by whenever they, they want, they take youths or, or, or people, uh, arrest simply under Prevention of Terrorism Act. There is, for one and a half years, you can put them in the, behind the bars without, without any trial or anything. So this is still there. Therefore, this kind of, uh, uh, under this kind of uh, uh, military rule and the prevention draconian law, only we are living. So that's why uh, when he says I'm emotional, I am part of the society. I know I'm a friend, but still I'm part of the society. And I'm working with the society, for the societies. Every day we are facing such problems. That's why I'm, 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 I'm talking. So if I'm emotional, I'm sorry if I'm emotional, but it is fact, 100% fact. No comment. Oh. Okay, well, I'll ask a question. I mean, you're a lawyer, right? So the, the PTA, right? People detained under the PTA, people not charged or um, uh, released. Is that a perennial problem, right? Which has happened in previous governments, and every time a new government comes, there's expectation. Mm. Because there's a new government, things will be changed. Can we expect things to change now? You know, the PTA, which I don't agree, it's a very draconian piece of law in Sri Lanka. Uh, PTA applied uh, similarly to the JVP or Sinhala rebels also, Sri Lanka. It is not a piece of legislation which purposely uh, aimed at uh, uh, Tamils. Uh, it is a tool used by state uh, to contain uh, rebellion, which I don't agree, uh, philosophical. Uh, but uh, in the immediate future, the chances of abolishing PTA is not there, frankly saying. Because, uh, uh, but uh, you can shelve it. For, for instance, uh, in last several two or three years, the Attorney General's department has not indicted uh, people under the PTA. So it would be a uh, weapon in a Pandora's box, where state will time to time, I'm, 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 I'm saying that's how the states are thinking, because states are not hermits, right? So we have to understand the reality. But that's what I meant, that people are still arrested under PTA, but they're not charged. So this is not a question of abolishing the law, yeah. but actually applying the rule of law. No, I mean, uh, now, so, uh, I think my, my, according to my knowledge, the people are arrested in case of arrest uh, under the normal law, under the emergency law, but not on the PTA, unless in extreme cases, right now, in last year and now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, in the future excuse, also... Excuse me, that emergency is removed uh, to three years. Yeah, backwards. that's true, but time to time you can, you can uh, implement it by the president. Uh, very extreme situations, we have seen PTA was used but our, our argument for the government is that you need not to have a PTA because under the penal code, the offences against the state is there, so you can work. So you need not to have a... Unfortunately, this was borrowed from British government, right? The PTA, if you look at the preamble, uh, the preamble is straight away imported from British PTA. So the various countries are using as states, although we don't like that. 
but i i think gradually the you uh, utilization of that piece of legislation will be uh, declined hmm. why you yeah, know now the, now the uh, not from this uh, what do you call from the democratic point of view there is a opinion within the society that uh, using of pta is uh, not suitable in decent societies Do you have a comment? No, oh, that is, is, is uh, it's point of view. So I don't, I don't, uh, I cannot uh, deny that. <laughs> so public dialogue, it's very polite. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I had a, another question. Great. Um, you talked about the middle ground. What, what is the middle ground? That depending on the issue. Now, there are so many middle grounds in Sri Lankan context. one is when in relation to the uh, uh, the conflict the policy conflict between the the tamil political action and the state so the middle ground for that is as i said uh, earlier uh, ensuring the political liberty and the political equality for the people of uh, north and east then converting into that uh, into action is based on the solution solution still it not uh, possible to understand what is the best solution for sri lanka on the other hand reconciliation reconciliation when it come to reconciliation or transitional justice uh, middle ground is uh, accepting the fact that civilians have died in the hands of by whoever right mm -hmm. so state has to acknowledge and apologize right so that is the middle ground so with that now now whether we are going to international mechanism or local mechanism is not the issue first the state has to acknowledge terrible thing happen in my our head on the same time if you take the south african thing somebody now there is nobody to take the responsibility from the tamil side so they also have to acknowledge that something happened from our hand for civilians not for anybody not the state civilians were affected from both ends that is a fact unfortunately that is not discussed in international fora from point of view of uh, human rights human rights activist or humanitarian law activist i have to say that from both sides violated human rights the civilian rights but unfortunately that 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 issue is not coming and there is nobody to take responsibility uh, for those atrocities because there is nobody to claim that i am i represent the ltt there, there is nobody to say i don't know whether mr nadiyavan or somebody will come forward and say no we we are responsible but there is nobody that is a there is other problem of this issue the both parties use civilians for their own ends that is a fact so that's why at the beginning i said when you politicize the issue you put the you start the blame game we need a middle ground as well as a middle group of people to look at this from objective point of view uh <clears throat> anyway so i never uh, say that uh, when i talk about the responsibility of the government and i do not say that only the government has to come out with the casualties of tamils it is the whole picture of course it is at the worst time or in the last war when we talk so far about this last war the 146000 what i said is in the last war in the last almost in the last month but entire entire 30 years of war it is more than 300000 people tamils were killed of course number of singles also were killed in bombing in singular civilian in train in bus stand in, in in areas i agree with that i do not say that no i am not talking about singular civilian i am talking about tamil civilians no no that's what i am in the hand now in both the sides what i say is the, the killing of both the sides so um 
I, I, I don't uh, disagree with that. So it is necessary to come out with that, but that is when we uh, talk from the beginning, it's about the last, last war and the legacy of the last war. It is not the entire, uh, entire system. So if it is entire thing, then it is, uh, it is as he said, it is, that part is also there, that is also to be addressed. I'm not denying that. Okay. Um, I think we might open it up to the floor. Yes. Um, so what I'm going to propose, what I'm going to propose is I'll take three sets of questions, uh, and could you indicate to either or both person you want to respond? Um, um, I would encourage you to ask robust questions, but please don't give speeches. I reserve the right to shut you down if you start giving a speech. So it's one person here. Put your hand up, please, and, and one person there. Third person there. And if pe people could introduce themselves as well, please. Uh, my name is Vijay Anand uh, from Confluence uh, magazine. Uh, my question is this. Before I ask the question, I, I'm very appreciative of the fact that the new government is uh, trying to introduce a new political culture in Sri Lanka. Um, and also you mentioned the fact that not necessarily 40,000 people, even if one person was killed by the state, it has to be thoroughly investigated according to the uh, agreement, etc. That's very good. Uh, however, now you were also discussing about reaching middle ground. Just before I came for this meeting, I read a news clip from Kalamu Mira. It says, Ranit Vikram Singha has said, we will protect Mahinda Gotha Fonseca from war crime probe UN. If that is the case, still, if they say openly, we will protect them even before the investigation starts. That is, uh, uh, where can we reach the middle ground? Even before the case starts, if the Prime Minister... Okay, thank you. So, uh, you're asking from me? No, uh, no. Let's take three questions. Mm -hmm. And then at the back there, and then the front here. Uh, I think both uh, talked about uh, reconciliation. I think it's a very wonderful word, especially when it comes to conflict resolution and conflict resolution NGOs and everyone talk about reconciliation and it's a wonderful word. I think even the hardliners won't disagree uh, for uh, conflict resolution between warring parties, so at least openly uh, don't disagree. But my question is, um, I can understand the Tamil people's urge for reconciliation because they, for them to survive in the island, they have to reconcile with the other party. I can understand that. But what's the motivation for the singular people to uh, come forward and support the, this reconciliation process? Uh, even the current situation, even parliamentarians from uh, Survey Students Party, Tamil Nationals Alliance, say, don't say a few words that will antagonize the singular public. Uh, words such as uh, political words like uh, federalism, self-determination, even 13 plus, some, uh, some, says, some people say that 13 plus is uh, equal to cessation. So I don't know how uh, what's the motivation and how you're going to do this uh, okay. reconciliation? That's uh, third row. Hi, uh, James Ingram from the Commonwealth Secretariat. Um, I just wanted to ask both speakers um, what uh, faith they would place in the uh, practical advantage uh, that the National Human Rights Commission uh, could play um, in um, as, a, as a national um, level institution, but one which should, in a normative respect, be independent of the state. Um, so what role it could play either in its, uh, in its current state with its current commissioners or in, a, in an ideal way. Okay. Um, do you want to start? How about the role of the Human Rights Council? Human Rights Commission. The National Human Rights Commission. So you want to ask? Is yeah, if you respond to me or him, to both speakers. Both. Okay. 
Uh, of course, we, ha we have a, a human rights uh, council in Sri Lanka, but uh, it has no power, actually. They can uh, simply record it. And that is why the previous, uh, not previous, before Navani uh, Dampil, uh, it is, uh, what's her name? She was the Robertson? No. Yeah. Robinson. So she came Robinson. to Sri Lanka and said that uh, Sri Lanka's uh, Human Rights Council is, do not have teeth. It is uh, simply uh, record the things. And also government uh, do not give any power. They are unable to do anything. Therefore, the branch of the United Nations Human Rights Council should be established in Colombo. That was her proposal, and it was vehemently opposed by Rajapaksa Raji. Uh, this is the status in Sri Lanka. The Human Rights Council is for the namesake. They are unable to do anything. Uh, that is, if that council functions effectively, or that council works it, uh, uh, for its uh, goal, then there is no need we go to Geneva and uh, complain. The Sri Lankan uh, council would have been done. That's why I all along said the domestic, all the mechanisms are completely uh, politicized, or uh, it is not uh, just for the namesake to show, show to the world that we have all the syst systems we have, but all the batteries are removed. They will not function. Okay. Do you want to comment on the other two speakers? Uh, no, what he said is almost uh, the same question okay. I, 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 I uh, uh, raised, and also he asked the question, the, what, are the, what is the motivation that is... Uh, as because of your optimism side, he asked it. So okay. Not... All right, sir. Okay, on, on Mr. Ranil Vikramasinghe's statement, uh, that's why I said in this game, there are a lot of rhetorics. So don't uh, bother about rhetorics in politics. But on the other hand, there's, there's a point where yeah, even in my presentation also I mentioned this. I also personally argue argues that there is no planned genocide in Sri Lanka. So when I say that planned genocide, if there was a planned genocide, command structure is also responsible and you have to prove there is a policy, national policy to kill Tamil civilians. Now you know the, the the proceedings of the Nuremberg trial. What happened? Right? So, so, rhetorically you can say, but I have my own doubt as a lawyer, international law, as a student of international law, I mean, without aligning to any, any side, my personal view is that there is no uh, planned genocide. So, if there is no planned genocide, uh, then you can't, bl you can't uh, attribute that to Mahindra Rajapaksa or Fonseca. But there may be several other official officers who are responsibility, responsible for atrocities. That you have to go into. So, I don't know. Mr. Vikramasinghe must have told uh, such a statement with that kind of in, uh, idea in the mind. So, this is my interpretation. Uh, so, for the second thing, I think Sinhalese wants reconciliation because we want stability. The country wants stability. You can't continue with this uh, conflict forever. If you want to flourish, if you want to stable, if you want to have a, because now Sri Lanka is a middle income country, right? Uh, it needs this uh, uh, harmony. It needs uh, multicultural harmony and multicultural stability. Without th that, you can't think about FDIs. You can't think about economy, right? So, and also, the otherwise, other thing is, this when you have this kind of war, you create dictators. 
Now, dictator ultimately takes the democratic life of the whole country. So, it's a, it's a vicious circle. So, therefore, you know, like-minded people, I mean, people who can understand the, the problem uh, of Sinhalese community understand and they, they work for that. They want to resolve this. They don't want to see that this will continue forever. So, that's, so therefore, there are certain uh, uh, opportunity costs where a single community has to think. That's why time to time, except this previous government, all government try to resolve it. Right? Uh, for the third question, uh, the National Human Rights Commission and Human Rights Council are two different uh, notions. I agree with the with uh, uh, Sarvesh that uh, in Sri Lanka the National Human Rights Commission does not have teeth. Uh, you have to amend the act and you have to give more powers in relation to the implementation of decisions of the National Human Rights Commission. Uh, so a lot of things have to be done in that area. And I also agree that even in, 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 in future, uh, futuristic uh, reconciliation process, uh, we, we, we anticipate that the Human Rights Commission can play a uh, much more bigger role in arbitration or organizing, uh, 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 arbitrating between the state and the affected civilians. So, Commission would be a good arbitrator in that if you, because now after the 19th Amendment, uh, Human Rights Commission is also considered as one of the commission to be functioned under the Constitutional Council. So it is depoliticized. Now, right now it is politicized institution. So once you depoliticize, uh, you can ex expect more results from the Human Rights Commission. Okay, let's take some more questions. It's excellent. Uh, one, two, three. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Arani from Kingston University London and um, we've heard um, a lot about the kind of higher level political reconciliation things and I guess I want to talk more about your roles as middle tier leaders and what you understand for more local level reconciliation and we've heard from a lot of men today and my question really is about the role of women in the psychosocial um, reconciliation on the ground, especially considering the war legacy of so many female-headed households and their vulnerability in the north and the east. I'm uh, Brendan O'Duffy from Queen Mary. I have two questions, but they're quick. Um, does the emerging competition among or within the Tamil diaspora groups in the UK and, el and elsewhere does that make reconciliation easier or more difficult? And the second question is related, I think. Is 13 plus still a basis for some sort of stable constitutional settlement? Hi, um, my name's Josh from Kings, and this is to both gentlemen. Um, if no real pro progress is made towards a truth and reconciliation process by the new government over the coming years uh, or months, does then the UN have a legal as well as a moral duty to interfere under their own responsibility to protect Charter? And if you believe they do have a responsibility, how much time should we give the new government uh, to match their words with actions? Okay. Yeah. On role of women, I I am very proud to say that at the moment, uh, I think Sarvesh would also agree with me. The win there is an organisation called uh, Women in Need uh, with the support of Asia Foundation. I know that very powerful, very effective counselling service is conducted in North and North Northern Province. Uh, on psychosocial reconciliation, uh, war-affected families are... But the issue is, the, the magnitude of the issue 
does not uh, allow us to say that uh, the psychosocial reconciliation is happening at that level. Uh, women groups are working and women are ma more empowered in new conditions uh, to do, do that. But still, it is not happening as a state policy. Most of the NGOs and civil society are involved with that. Uh, but uh, I would say that uh, the techniques and experience is there. And I know that the WIN is working with the Provincial Council Health Ministry, uh, Northern Provincial Council. That knowledge and the experience what they have developed through that project can be utilized in future grand scale program. I have nothing to say about diaspora competition and I don't know much about that. Uh, 13 plus is the basis for next negotiation. 13 plus, there is no such a thing. Uh, the, the, that was Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksa's hallucination, I would say, right? Just 13 then. Yeah, 13 is a basis. 13 is a basis. I mean, there are two views on that. My, my personal view is uh, use 13, improve that structure, Im because if you look at the, as Sarvesh has told earlier, in every part, every country, you have spoilers. You can't ex ex expect uh, spoilerless negotiations, right? So what you have to do is how to deal with spoilers is the most important thing. So if you are going for a new constitution, entirely new constitution, you have to go for a referendum because of the existing entrenched uh, clauses are there. So referendum will give a sort of a problematic uh, uh, challenge for transformation. Therefore, if we can use the 13th Amendment as a basis and improve the structures, improve the, uh, what, even unilaterally you can do that. Uh, my argument, my personal argument, that the concurrent list cannot be, um, can the government, state, can not utilize in favor of the state. So then you can, through the Finance Commission, you can put more money to North, North and East uh, Provincial Council. Then come to the next, next stage, like uh, dealing with uh, land powers or other, introducing new powers. So now if you look at India, it took 20 years to see a matured states. It, it came 1970s. Now look at the Belfast Agreement. Now, after 10 years of Belfast Agreement, they gave police powers, right? So, the problem is this discourse is awkward. Now, international inf information is there, but th those information are used at your will. So, but the, in given situation, my argument is use 13th Amendment as a platform and gradually improve because when it happens, time will uh, develop the conf necessary confidence among the South also, right? So that is very vital for me. I mean, I know that when I say that you have to uh, develop the uh, Southern consensus, you will ask, somebody will ask, how can you expect, how many time you have to, how long you have to wait uh, in this game? So I don't know. but. This is my point of view. Uh, time period. Uh, the fourth question asked about. Uh, well, it's a question about um, how long should the entire committee give you? I don't think this time, uh, that time uh, will be given. I mean, there would be a report, definitely. Uh, that's what I feel from Geneva, right? So, but recommendation will not come. There would be a primary, prima facie report. Uh, based on that, then the, it will go to the working group one and see whether, what is the proper mechanism to do that, uh, handle such prima facie evidence. 
so then it's the responsibility of the government i don't think that the time factor uh, is in favor of sri lankan government so i think i can uh, say something about uh, the role of women and the women affected it is uh, i am in the last two years as a provincial councillor working in the northern province among uh, considerably among women and uh, especially the wrd is called women rural development societies uh, they formed as societies actually this uh, uh, they were formed to get uh, uh, government benefits such as micro credits etc but a lot of uh, 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 organizations are going out of fund but uh, from these uh, wrds if you go to the northern province from 30 to 50 percent widows uh, i don't say all up all are war widows but of course including war widows so sort of uh, 30 to 50 percent in the in the every every village uh, Uh, WRT as you have, and from my allocation, of course, in this time, twenty-two hundred thousand I allocated for twenty-two societies. But a lot of people they have a lot of problem because the woman-headed families, even they do not know what they can do to empower them. They do not have even idea of themselves. We discuss for hours and hours, and then uh, then now we are planning to. uh go for a provincial through provincial council some new projects with small uh capital to get their livelihood uh, pro- programs that kind of a uh, programs we, we are working out in that case another thing that uh, the counseling matter it is uh, it was there by number of some ngos but it is also to there is a negative side that previous governor of jaffna I mean northern province stopped uh, abruptly for uh, certain uh, areas the counseling because uh, he said that those who are on counseling are sort of uh, some intelligence of uh, the international community this and that and all these things so uh, it is it is a kind of a security uh, threat issue something like that then it was we 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 protested and then uh, the new government uh, it is uh, let loose to work work for that allowed to work that uh this is uh, on the part of it is actually the war uh, uh created a large number of women headed families and 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 it needs a lot of things to address that part of it and we are trying our best to uh, address those part uh but that is not adequate we know that we uh, we are uh, uh, we are planning new new ideas on that uh, second point the uh, 13 plus uh, the concept is uh, it is a uh, time to time indian government said uh, uh, to sri lankan government that uh, go for 13 plus so 13 plus plus etc it is very weak uh, kind of a uh, language what uh, they mean the plus and what the sri lankan uh, i mean president rajapaksa felt plus and rajapaksa said what i said that plus means uh, uh, senate uh, bring out the senate second, yes. so that means the second chamber or to the parliament and then that is uh, actually it's uh, uh, anyway it's a uh, 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 there is also a vague idea uh, but uh, uh, when uh, my friends ral said it is a 13th amendment as a starting point i would say 13th amendment i don't want to go into detail i can uh, explain it but it is a uh, uh, time time constraint is there but uh, 13th amendment can implement absolutely at the mercy of the president if president don't like you cannot do it simply he can through the governor and the chief secretary through uh, uh, through uh, what you call uh, administrative mechanism you can cripple the provincial council system the last one and a half years we were crippled and now we started functioning i think he know that yes difficult question to answer <laughs> so that is that is uh, the one part is uh, that is as i said because the another point i would make that uh, uh, previous foreign affairs minister uh, uh, professor gl peris 
Co in, in international forums, he openly accepted that the provincial council systems has uh, serious fundamental flaws and it cannot be, uh, what do you call, uh, it cannot be a solution. We have to go for a, uh, I mean, we have to enrich or we have to go for uh, a kind of a new solution. Uh, third point, the police matter. It is already there in the constitution. Of course, it is not absolute police power, but from constable to ASP, a provincial council can recruit and give promotions. That is part of the constitution, but for last 25 years, the government is openly uh, denying to implement the constitution, part of the constitution. And even the President Rajabaksa openly in every other day said, I will not give you the police power. I will not give you the land power. That is part of the constitution. That means the president took oath on the constitution and openly violating the constitution in open forums. If I do that, it is a violation of constitution. It is, it is I will be in, behind the bars. But president openly said that he is supposed to protect the constitution and, 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 and uh, implement the constitution, said I will not implement it. This is the situation. This uh, police power is there. I mean, it is not absolute police power, but at least a partial police power is there in the constitution. But from the beginning, I mean, in 1987, the Indolang Agreement came and the uh, 13th Amendment came, and still it is not implemented, and uh, all the presidents are denying to implement it. Okay. Do you want to say something about uh, the UN? Yeah. The question uh, about how much time should should the International Committee allow Sri Lanka? Uh, that I am not sure, but it is already, uh, I mean, it is almost like a promise is given by the UNHRC <laughs> chairman that uh, it will be uh, uh, released by September. Uh, may, may I uh, say something on that 19th Amendment thing? Okay. Uh, my, my, why I said that it is difficult to answer, 19, through 19th Amendment, the Finance Commission, or there are certain commission can be uh, utilized as independent bodies, but the governor's power uh, is not controlled. Uh, so therefore, yes and no answer I have to give you. Okay, we'll take, an, uh, it's eight o'clock. I think we might continue for a little bit longer. Um, so we'll take another three questions. Um, I'm not back there. So one white shirt. Um, two, and three. <laughs> okay. All right, fine, fine. It's your show. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I have to say that I'm Colombian, so I'm an ignorant on these matters. My name is Andre Gomez. I'm a lecturer at Los Andes University in Bogota, but I'm so glad to be here because we in Colombia have a peace process. And from what I've heard today, we have pretty much the same problem. And this is the issue that I want to raise to you. Because in the, in the case, what I've heard is that both sides, or the three sides that I can identify here, the, the Tamils, um, the hardliners, and the government that is not a hardliner at the moment, both are somehow minimizing uh, the responsibilities that they have in terms of causing victims during the during the armed conflict, and and my and I think this shows that there is that the first victim of an armed conflict is morality, and that's the reason why I re I'm reacting a bit harshly on something that you said when you said that politics you know is not about morality when it, it should be about morality. And when you really have something going on at the moment, it shouldn't be because of the economic cost benefit that you are gonna gain out of it, but because you want to restore morality. So my question to both of you is, how are we gonna do in, con in countries like Colombia and Sri Lanka to restore morality, and that could be a way for reconciliation? Thank you. Hi, um, I'm, my name is Atika. I'm an economist and I work in a development bank in London. Um, my question is on um, 
a comment that you made on uh, the fact that you're a little less optimistic on reconciliation in terms of victim perpetrator reconciliation. So this might seem like quite a naive question, but I know very little about the background. Um, but what do you think is the threat of the same kind of movement that um, grew in the, in the Tamil community happening again? And if there is such a threat, what's being done at the grassroots to prevent this kind of um, movement sprouting up again, um, if there is not this reconciliation going on at the grassroots level? Um, thank you. Okay. Uh, where was so, the third one? Please. Thank you. Sri Lankan problem is a very complicated problem and it's very vicious. Uh, so we need, uh, we have lots of thorns and shards on the long way to reconciliation. So we may not be able to have one go to resolve the conflict, but we may have to uh, remove lots of thorns, lots of shards on the way, like for example, like implementing official policy or meeting the needs of uh, the homeless, uh, damaged houses, building houses, or giving employment to youth, or fishing restrictions, or farming, things like that. We have to look at small, small uh, things, uh, uh, remedy them, so we will reach the recons the path or the ultimate goal. So how is that uh, anybody doing that? Okay, Phil. It's off. <clears throat> let, let, let me go back to one of the overarching themes of the event and, and the series. Um, and that's this role of, of middle tier leaders. And you, you've spoken a lot about your respective roles at the elite level, and maybe it's because we interrogated both of you for two hours each this morning on your role as middle tier leaders, but I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. You've both been involved in a range of initiatives, the One Text Initiative, various workshops, other processes that try to connect national and community level peace and reconciliation. Just wondering if you could say a little bit more about that, and how do you bring grassroots level actors into these national discussions that you've already been talking about. Thanks. Yeah, actually that, that was the first question asked. We didn't come back to that. Um, do you want to start? Yeah, um, let me just one. Um, um, we can start with Phil. It's about or? morality. No, it's uh, whom I have to ask. Well, uh, morality was from back there. Um, I, yeah, that is, uh, how do you restore morality to Sri Lanka? Small question. Uh, anyways, moral itself, as a concept, morality itself is differ from society to society. Something is moral to me, may be moral to you. Uh, that is a basic problem. But as uh, earlier I explained, here in Sri Lanka, it's seriously, there are a number of dimensions of the conflict. So the one dimension is that the conflict between the fact and myth. That's why we say it is the, the, the activities of the singular polity, of the attitude of the singular polity is immoral. But uh, the singular polity, it is not a kind of a rationally challenged, but using their government power or, or the ruling power and the military, they are just, uh, what do you call, they are challenging uh, authoritatively, not rationally. So the question of moral and immoral, I think, is this part, number one. And number two, when it comes to reconciliation, if it is both the side become turned to be rational, then I think reconciliation is a very easy task. So because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a conflict between a rational and irrational, or a moral and immoral. So where the change should be need, I don't uh, think that Tamils are 
for a long uh, decades yearning for peace and reconciliation, but not as slaves, but with the dignified citizens, with equal status. That is the uh, problem. But when uh, my friend said it is single is also wanted, the, my problem is he accepts that the Sri Lankan uh, government system is not the majority democracy, but majoritarian democracy. The majoritarianism means it's at the cost of the minority, you know, is the meaning. That is the interest at the cost of the minority. So therefore you can understand now the, 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 the conflict, where the conflict lies. So it needs, uh, as I earlier said, it needs a kind of a, a, a drastic change in the mindset. The philosophy that, the mythical philosophy that governs a singular politics should be changed. They are supposed to accept the truth. They have to reconcile with the truth, with the fact. Then the reconciliation is no more an issue. Automatically it, it, it will reach to the point. The second um, question on um, the grassroots level participation. Mm, no, actually it's about whether... Step by step it, approach. It'll be about re return to conflict. Is that right? Yeah, it's about the internal the grassroots level. Because you talk about a high level of political solution, reconciliation, etc. at the grassroots level. Yeah, it's, it is it is it is it is it is actually still a simmering issue because uh, the war it is a huge uh, uh, made a huge damage to entire North and Eastern province, men and material wise. So people are very much uh, what you call in a very uh, very low in moral, and, but at the same time, they, it's a large section of the population still is kind of a, uh, what do you call, like uh, uh, the so sort of you know, simmering, uh, the feeling, but they cannot do anything because they are completely under army. That means I am not saying that they are going to take up arms, but that much of uh, suppression much more than uh, on the period of war is now. So that is why, as uh, uh, Madam Sir posed the question, after the war, usually in many democracies, they used to address the war atrocities and war crimes or uh, war damages. That is the first priority in Sri Lanka in the last six years after the war is from uh, not even a single budget they specifically put any allocation or anything for war atrocities or war damages or whatever. Completely they uh, black out that. In every budget speeches you can see the parliament you go to the Hansat, the Tamil uh, National Part, some Tamil National Alliance, Alliance uh, members were fingering these issues and government is completely uh, uh, black out that there is no problem in this country like it's, it is it is very and all the uh, six uh, budgets gradually increase after the war gradually increase the allocation for defense F big fortified and big forts like a huge large amount of uh, amount and sizes of military complexes in the northern northern eastern provinces. So anyway, uh, so this is kind of a situation. It's there. It is not uh, the the there is no such climate to return to arms, but uh, people are still confident, and they are uh, the Sri Lankan Tamil uh, Tamils from 1930s when they introduced the voting system in Sri Lanka that. Uh, a universal franchise. Um, they vote or boycott for their rights, never for rights. Even after the war, when they were behind the barbed wires and in the what you call number of refugee camps, the government uh, went and tried to give a lot of uh, things and get the votes, but they, the votes were just opposite. 
against the government further and further. What I'm saying is, from the late colonial era to now, the Tamils are absolutely, even when they die, when they killed, when they lost, they vote for their rights. This is the strength because they believe their cause is just. They are for just. So this is the strength of even the number is less, even they are poor and they are uh, So this is their strength still. That is what protecting them at least uh, up, to the, up to this moment. May I say something about this morality issue? It is a very relevant question in conflict resolution. Now, most important thing in the conflict resolution is pragmatism, not the morality. Now, if you take three issues from civil war in America, Punjab massacre, or Sinn Féin's decision uh, to go into, uh, or Jerry Adams' decision to go into a peace deal, or uh, Nelson Mandela's internal argument, whether when they were talking about power sharing with whites, forgetting about atrocities, all have shown uh, pragmatism and visionary leadership. Uh, what is lacking in Sri Lanka is that pragmatic approach. Now, what is, now if you look at the way, now, now this is, um, I know that when I say this, uh, I don't give space for the sufferings of the innocent people. But the, if you look at the way the solutions were made, the leaders have shown they want to keep the history behind when they want to do that. I mean, the famous discussion between Cyril Ramphosa and uh, Nelson Mandela when the ANC leadership was blackguarding uh, uh, Mandela. Why are you talking and why are you uh, uh, saying to forget what whites have done for us? So uh, read the statement, then look at what Jerry Adams did. So morality is there, there is no argument. That's why I, I, as an individual, uh, I'm saying that you have to give a, a, a space for morality. But on the other hand, in politics, I don't see that in from um, this, this, this is a democratic country. The way the, the British government dealt with the uh, Northern Ireland issue is, is in the history, right? So therefore, uh, the morality is one thing and uh, pragmatism is one thing. What, what we see in Sri Lankan issue is that we have not seen two pragmatic guys, at least. We are, still we are searching for it. We are, we are searching. We want one from Tamil community and one from Singhala or the state, two guys who can be pragmatic, not cry babies, right? So this is one thing. On the on the grassroots thing, uh, I, I I agree with this, madam, uh, that in this kind of very escalated, long period escalated conflicts, I mean Sri Lanka. The history shows how it step by step escalated. So you have to de-escalate. So how to de-escalate? De-escalation de happens step by step. But no, no scientific approach happened in Sri Lanka in that respect. So that is the problem. Uh, grassroots level issue, uh, uh, yes. Uh, now, Sri Lanka, my, 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 if you look at the Sri Lankan context, uh, we don't have a civil society, sorry to say, right? We don't have citizens in Sri Lanka. We have voters. All professionals, all civil society are looking through the glasses of their parties. So therefore, there is no abstract or middle approach for that. So they are very difficult to find a middle ground in Sri Lanka. So that creates intimidative politics. So everybody is trying to push you against the wall and uh, get the advantage. This was not a common, th I mean, uncommon thing if you look at the Belfast politics in 80s. That was there. 
so so in in ethnically tense polities this is a very very natural thing uh, so therefore so once again one ultimately come to the victim perpetrator uh, reconciliation my position is not that we cannot reconcile between victims and the perpetrators but still it is not matured the 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 situation is not matured to strike such a deal but we should not uh, give up the such effort we have to go for that but in one day uh, one day means not in after another 20 years time but within a uh, very reasonable time frame uh, we have to do that but you have to start from like something like joint narration of the history there are there are his, there are techniques uh, instead of rushing for that so uh, as she said that step by step approach has to be applied so what do you expect from the diaspora uh, but, but but i think there a fell's question which is the theme of this yeah this event which is inside of i mean uh, mid level pe- um, leaders right i think it would be useful to say something on those lines if you have a question please put your hand up i will pick you out let's start with <coughs> Yeah, this is uh, Phil's question about uh, our role, or is that my role in, as a middle-level leader between the national efforts and the uh, grassroots level efforts. Um, it is in the direct connotation of reconciliation process. My experience is uh, more with period of chandrika bandarnaka's political package along with the political package she started uh, some kind of movement for reconciliation named in sudan elemin singala in white lotus in english um, the white lotus movement is basically to uh, move village to village and make awareness uh, programs through speeches through uh, different kind of arts dramas etc to make the singular population to accept the federal system or its kind of a power sharing system uh, along with it they also introduced uh, a project called book and brick that is uh, the japna public library was burnt uh, earlier by the police and army uh, under the orders of the ministers so therefore in order to make the singular people feel that it is it is it is a mistake done or in a kind of a regret to say that every family is supposed to give one brick and one book to reconstruct that library so it is a kind of a reconciliation idea um there are a large number of uh, intellectuals professors uh, media men and all we were working together uh to uh, enhance the political package to be a reality but uh, i think it's around 2 years or so then uh the entire climate changed and hardliners took up a hand and uh chandrika bandarnaka declared for war for peace then the war escalated uh, to the level so our efforts uh, and the efforts gone waste uh so later after the chandrika bandarnaka's tenure is over when she became retired from the presidency in an interview she said i was uh, successfully keep the international community support with me by keep the political package alive so it seems that she was not uh, genuine to resolve the problem through the political package rather to keep that as uh, shral set in a pandora sort of show to the international community 
see that I am in the process, I am in the exercise of doing it. So later only we realized that it is also a kind of a politics of political resolution. Uh, this is a very bad experience that previously after the Indo-Langa agreement the 13th Amendment was introduced and that was in a, among the Tamils it is a two sides a, a section is not accepted a section uh, plan to go along with in support of India uh, to show to India that uh, Sri Lankan government will not deliver the goods in real sense. Uh, therefore, we accepted and we were working for one and a half years. And there are a lot of uh, southern uh, political leaders also came and they appreciated our work and this and that. And they said that we will be the pioneer to, uh, within one and a half years, we established a, a, a council and the secretariat, etc. So at that time, until such time, the southern uh, provincial council were unable to do anything. But within one half years, it is completely the President Premadasa uh, uh, completely gone against that he was against the political, uh, uh, against the provincial council system. So in Delhi, the uh, uh, LTT also did not uh, want for a pol that system. Because that system, as I already explained, that is, it is a fundamental flaws it had, and we had in, within this one half years, we had uh, the chief, former chief minister visited 20 times to meet the president to small, small things. Uh, and uh, the time, the provincial council came out with an alternative set of draft in place of that amendment in order to make it. That also we made, and we send it to the government, we send it to the diplomats. Uh, what I'm saying is, this is also our diehard work for reconciliation and to for a peaceful resettlement, I mean, res, uh, resolution of the conflict. Uh, in these two cases, I was one of the bulk in working a uh, lot of uh, involvement, a lot of important works uh, uh, or, or uh, accomplishing important tasks also. After Chandrika's regime, then it is a Rajabaksa regime. You know that Rajabaksa regime period, what has happened and the present regime. So now there is, as he said, now it is too early to talk about reconciliation. So therefore, we are waiting for a uh, climate. All right. Do you want to say something about your? Yeah, I mean, throughout the history, I played a role of interlocutor. Uh, I'm a friend of Tamils as well as I'm a critic of Tamil uh, politics. I'm, I'm working with the state as well as I'm working with the civil society. So, uh, for last three decades, what we tried is to see a uh, uh, durable and stable solution for this uh, process. In that regard, we started numerous uh, initiatives to, to bridge the gap. Uh, in the last, now, the, my effort would be, now we have seen two orthodox characters have met each other, that is, Mr. Prabhakaran and Mr. Mahindra Rajapaksa. So they fought each other and destroyed themselves. Now our quest is to find a, a visionary two leaders from both sides who can come into a deal or understanding to resolve this problem. I think uh, it is possible and it is uh, in near future we may be uh, able to do that, but the onus right now is within the Tamil community to find a visionary leader quickly and from Singhala society also we are also trying to find that visionary leader. So uh, up to then we have not stopped working on this. Uh, I involved with various initiatives like uh, uh, 
uh, one text initiative where we, we bring all the political parties uh, second level, second tier or the leaders or closer people to the leaders to one text and uh, in, uh, every month and various other times we, we try to develop consensual policies and pass now yeah, one instance where we, we develop when this even Mahindra Rajapaksa's time uh, when the national anthem issue came uh, we developed the certain policy how to deal with national anthem and also we produced a national anthem, a bilingual national anthem and uh, passed it to the government, then government, the, for the hardliners. So likewise, uh, there are a lot of things the middle leaders can do based on understanding and friendship. So I'm privileged that I have uh, that understanding and privilege with various political groups and uh, I will go on with this path which I have started as a student. So, uh, I, I will, I'll add one more thing that I didn't uh, tell that, that is One Text Initiative is a forum for functioning almost a decade in Colombo. It's a kind of a multi-party forum. Uh, bring all the uh, representative from all the parties, uh, take up main issues and discuss in order to reduce the gap between the leaders, uh, then once it is uh, uh, the sharing of opinions and discussing the opinions and uh, to reduce so that uh, uh, the conflict on important issues may be uh, reduced as much as possible. Um, it is uh, Shral and last two, more than two years, I am also part of it. Uh, uh, and in, especially in Jaffna district, I support and I, I do as much as uh, possible my uh, cooperation to the functions of the uh, One Text Initiative. Uh, so far, the One Text Initiative projects are with uh, top level and middle level leaders and not uh, reached to the grassroots so far. But I do not know that um, uh, uh, they may ha have plan actually. Uh, now it is. Uh, they just gone down to the middle level leaders and the regional level kind of leaders. Uh, so far not uh, going to the mass level, it is, uh, it is mass level or the grassroots level, it would have been a sort of a big project and plan. Uh, they may have planned, but in that case, uh, we will work together. We are working together, we will work together. Even though we uh, now we had number of issues we differed and in some number of issues we uh, had a same uh, or similar opinion. Uh, this is not uh, sort of personal. It's when it comes to collective. It is the fact. It is the issue. It is the conflict. So any local mechanism effectively developed, it is we wish <coughs> we will cooperate, will work. Okay, shall we take another round of questions? So I think we yeah, it's, it's, um, our guests have been uh, with us since nine o'clock this morning, or 8.30 this morning. So I think um, it's a very long day. Um, do you want to wrap up? Yeah. <coughs> Good, um, just a, a quick plug for the next two events in this series. Um, in October and November, we've got public dialogues on South Africa and Northern Ireland, so we'll ensure that you all know about those. Thank you to all of you for coming out uh, this evening. Thanks to the AB guys and to the Fetzer Institute and the Politics SOAS Department um, for helping us put this uh, event on. Most importantly, thank you so much to our panellists, to Suka for, for chairing uh, the dialogue, to Shiral and Savez uh, for taking part and coming to London at a particularly politically volatile time uh, in Sri Lanka. We know it wasn't easy uh, to, to prize you away from all the machinations taking place back in Colombo, but uh, we, we really value you being here for the whole research project and taking part in a, a really uh, open and, uh, and, and honest and frank uh, conversation with each other uh, this evening. So um, please, I just ask you all to uh, express your thanks to the panellists. Thank you very much. <laughs>